Uh, so next, for our last presentation of the evening, I'd like to welcome Susan Warner. She's the Global VP of Marketing for CoFence. CoFence, when I was first familiar with, with them, was referred to as FishMe, who I uh, have known for quite some time, but they are now CoFence. So Susan will be talking to us about fishing and why that's relevant to domestic violence. Thank hey, Susan. You. Am I on? I have to start my timer because I tend to talk a little long. Thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you today. So um, I have been in the cybersecurity uh, industry for about 10 years, but that's actually um, not my background. I'm a communications person. Um, and as a communications person, um, you know, definitely would love to understand uh, the audience that I'm talking to. Um, so social worker, I think that's what I got earlier. Social worker, social worker. Yes. Oh. Okay. Great. Um, so when I when I first got involved in cybersecurity, um, it was pretty overwhelming and it was scary. Honestly, um, I worked for a man who used to tell me stories that made me so nervous about doing anything online, browsing, sending an email. Um, you know, he used to talk to me about all the Russian hackers. Um, but over the years, I've learned that there are very simple things that you can do to just make sure that you can um, remain safe. So. Uh, today, what I'm going to want to talk to you about is, is really focus around fish me, uh, around phishing. Um, I'm going to talk about malware, um, spear phishing, malicious links, how to be safe with passwords, um, browsing in, in public, and then um, I'll um, reference you over to some free resources if you're interested. And this is information that you can apply um, both to um, your work environment. Um, and also to the clients that you're working with to make sure that they're being very um, responsible and safe and you know, doing a lot of the things that they, they should be doing to make sure that they um, don't you know, suffer theft or loss online. Um, so impacts, um, you know, the average victim loses about $142, which can be really significant and painful uh, to a lot of people. Um, 172 million in consumer-based um, cybercrime for uh, global losses, and that was just last year. It gets bigger every year. Um, and even more important is the, the impact to your time. Um, I've actually, uh, and I'm going to tell you a story a little bit later, I had a friend um, who was impacted by this, and she spent a good week. She took days off from work trying to straighten things out to talk to her bank. And so the time that it takes, you know, 24 hours, um, you know, almost three full working days, which, again, kind of equates back to my friend and, and what she went through, um, it's really quite an impact, whether it's financially or from your time um, or even just uh, if, if you get a, a bad piece of malware on your machine. Um, so malware is really just malicious software. It's, uh, it, it's the, the bad software that they attach um, to emails or, in, or, or within links or on um, uh, websites when there's malvertising where it says, oh, click here and you'll get something. Um, and you click and then all of a sudden your computer starts to act strange. It's just malicious software and it comes in a lot of different forms. Um, uh, a worm or a virus, I think uh, you know, most people have antivirus, and that's what that's really supposed to be protecting you from are, are these types. Um, a botnet, which is when your computer gets infected, but you don't really know it, and someone else has control of it. Um, and so they can use your, they can like log into your computer and then log into your email and start sending out spam messages. Um, or they can use your computer to um, go to a website page and go to it so many times that that website page stops working. It's called a, 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 a DDoS attack. Um, so there's different things that it can do, like taking over your computer, putting you into a botnet. Um, a banking trojan, and this is where a lot of that theft comes in. So when they're looking for, to, to steal, get, basically get your, your financial information, your banking information, um, and, and get into your accounts. And then ransomware. Has anyone heard of ransomware before? Yeah, so ransomware is when you download that, that malware and then it locks up your computer. And you get a message. I'm going to go through this. Basically, it locks up your computer and it says, you have this long to send me this much money and then I will unlock your computer or else I'm going to delete everything that's on your computer. And this happens a lot to um, individuals, and it also happens to organizations. 
um, there was a rash of ransomware attacks happening, oh, I think about, about nine or 12 months ago, and they hit hospitals pretty hard. Can you imagine working at a hospital and then your, your computer's on their network and then all of a sudden everybody's computers start locking up. You can't get the patient information. You don't know when your patients got their last um, medication. Um, it's also been known uh, to hit um, banks um, and again, a lot of other individuals. It really started out hit targeting individuals and then grew into targeting organizations. And at this point, you know, when it's, it's locked, down your, locked down your computer or locked down your networks, you have to make that decision of do I pay or do I let it go? And again, individually or an organization, it's a tough decision to try to make. And this is typically delivered through spam and phishing emails or other security vulnerabilities. So if there was something wrong with your last Microsoft update and they left some kind of a gap that a hacker could get through, that might be where how, how they got in. Banking Trojans, as I mentioned, steal your banking credentials. Um, key loggers, command and control, redirects to fake login pages. I'm going to show you some examples of these as we go forward. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that I got mobile malware in here. Um, because a lot of people think that their phones are safer from malware, um, and that's not true. Absolutely not. Um, and I saw this one, and I, and I thought, you know, specifically um, for um, domestic abuse, the Truth Spy. So it's a spyware that um, enables them to track activities across the phone. So it's basically putting spyware onto the phone so that you can track all the activities, what's happening on the phone, even almost like tracking the person using a GPS to track the person. And you don't know that this is on your, on your phone when you're using it. And it can, it can, it can track your, it can show your, your text messages. Um, so just again, think of it as a, there's a spy on your phone um, and they can watch where you're going, what you're doing, who you're chatting with. No, so malware is delivered to you by some activity that you've done. You, you wouldn't see that. You don't, know, you, you don't know that you have something like this on your phone um, unless, unless you've got something running against it or unless you're, you're looking for it specifically or you're noticing some strange activity on your phone. Because it, again, it's spyware. It's meant to be hidden, completely hidden, and you wouldn't be able to tell that you had it. So malware, um, again, malware is, is, is primarily delivered through phishing emails. Through phishing emails, again, or links. Um, I'm even going to kind of divert in, into social, even though it's not necessarily our space. But um, social, when you see someone that says, oh, hey, I just got this you know, in your Facebook chat, or they put a message on your page, and they say, hey, check out this link. Don't click it. Um, it's not worth it, no matter how much they say it's a really cute picture of something. or. Um, same thing with your email, right? Um, exercise caution with all links. If, if someone sends you a link or you get a link, um, think about it. Would this person send this to me? Should I be clicking on this? Um, do not download suspicious files. And I have a hard time with this um, because uh, school districts, for example, everything, every email that they send to us it has a, an attachment. You know, download the flyer to see more about this, and it's always a PDF or or a Word document. And I, you know, I check everything and make sure it's from who it's supposed to be, and then I download it. Um, and I know better, and I really shouldn't be doing it. Um, so attachments, be suspicious of files, and also think about when you're sending a file to someone. Do you really need to send a file to someone? Could you actually just put that copy into the email and send it to them if that's how you need to share it with them? Um, keep your software up to date. Make sure that you've done the latest updates, the latest patches, um, and make sure that you back up your computer. If you're working either um, on your work computer or on your home computer, make sure that you've got your important files either you know, copied over to the cloud. You can do a simple backup with um, Dropbox or um, iCloud. Um, I'm blanking on some others, but they're, 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 uh, Amazon, I think, also has a cloud service. Um, and they're free. I think Dropbox gives you like a, a certain amount for free. Just easy to make sure that all your important stuff is backed up and it's there in case you ever run into something like this. So spear phishing 
um, is, is the number one way to get you to open up an email. These are very, very targeted. Um, and they're sent, again, in an organization, so if you think about, again, a hospital, if someone was sent a spear, uh, a spear phishing, they might be used to access the, uh, the network and access all the data, um, access data that you have on your computers about your, your clients or that's shared across um, the network. Um, they use social engineering tactics. So they might go to LinkedIn and, and, and check you out and say, okay, so went to this school and I'm going to send her an email and I'm going to use her name and I'm going to say, hey, we were in this class together, uh, you know, back at Georgetown, do you remember? Um, and and kind of start this conversation and make it sound very, very specific. Um, they may even go so far as to, to look up who your boss is. Who is your boss? Let me impersonate their boss and send an email from their boss. Um, and so they're very, they're very smart about how they use their, their, their social engineering tactics. Again, they'll, they'll use Facebook, LinkedIn, um, anything that is online about you that they can find, they will use that to very specifically target you. Um, at work, they might do it to your group, right? Um, if, you're, if you work in a specific group, so for me in marketing, it might be a specific um, marketing email to the marketing team that they would send out. Um, so there's a lot of different tactics that, that they try when they're using a very targeted approach like this. Um, and these, these spear phishing emails are very, very successful. Um, they've been around for a very long time, and you would think that we would have figured out um, very specifically how to stop or, or really you know, just stop this threat from happening. But 93% of all the data breaches that you hear about, have you ever gotten um, a letter in the mail? that says your information might have been exposed, you should change your password. Um, I've gotten one from a few companies. Um, but that's pretty much, you know, the, the, these are the culprit. This is, this is how they initially get into the organization. So again, they deliver file attachments, they want you to click on a link, and they also want to try to trick you into giving over your credentials. So here's an example of a spear phishing email. So uses your name, it uses some familiarity. So hey, it's been a while since you've changed your password, right? A little bit of familiarity in that. In that. Um, it, also, uh, it, it also uses a little bit of urgency, right? It's creating a little bit of urgency in that, in that email saying, hey, you know, like, it's been a while since you've changed your password. Um, then hey, click on this link, right? That link is not gonna take you to the page to update your actual password, it's going to take you to another page that they set up that looks exactly like the page where you would update your password. And then they're just going to take that data. When you enter it in, they're just going to take it and keep it. And then they have access to your email account. So again, they're highly personalized. They, can, they might get your name, your mailing address. Um, they're trying to get your bank account numbers, the names of your employers. Um, again, even if the message comes from someone that you know, um, again, they might go into LinkedIn and see that you know, you're connected to Mary, and then they're going to be Mary and send you a, a note through, 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 through LinkedIn. Um, double barrel. Um, so not all phishing emails have links or attachments, and that's part of what, what makes them very, very difficult. Um, it might just be text. So the first email in a double barrel will say, you know, maybe this is, this, this is your boss, right? So, hey, I'm about to jump on a flight, just wanna let you know I'm gonna be sending you a file when I land or when I get Wi-Fi on the plane, right? And it looks like it's from someone that you know. And then the next email that they follow up, hey, here's that file I was gonna send you, right? So it breaks down that trust and that suspicion with the first email by, by preparing you, by saying, hey, I'm gonna send this over to you, and then follows up with it. And of course it has, you know, a link or, or malware attached to it. And then at work, when you're thinking about those emails that come from um, HR or the, they come from finance, um, hey, I, you know, we misplaced your, um, your tax forms. Would you mind sending me your social security number again so I can look them up? And it looks like it came from someone in your finance or your HR department. Um, that, you know, again, stopping and thinking about is this the type of information that they would ask me for? And is this the type of information that I'm comfortable giving to them is very important. Um, business email compromise is actually um, used, it's called also CEO fraud. 
because they really like to use it to create like some level of urgency. It's typically an email to the finance department from the CEO of a company. And I've talked to several CEOs and, and finance groups who unfortunately this happened to them. You know, where it was, it, where it just seems so valid. Um, in fact, um, at my own company, um, our uh, VP of finance caught a fish like this um, and it actually had an attachment to it um, and it was a very serious piece of malware that would have really compromised our company. Um, and, it, and it was very, very much, um, sounded very much like our CEO and something that he would, have, he would have asked for. But he was smart and he stopped and he thought about it and he called him and he said, what, what are you, did you just send me this email, what are you looking for? Um, and that was how it was disrupted. All right, so best practices on, on what you need to do when you're seeing emails come in and you're not really familiar with them. Check the sender. Um, think about clicking or downloading something and never ever send sensitive information. So I'm gonna see if I have one of these emails in here. Other ways to kind of spot, spot a fish. Um, grammar, spelling, punctuation, syntax. Um, a lot of these phishing emails that, that come through and that I see um, through my organization are horrible. They have, they're, they're, they, they, capitalization is missing, they're not, they're not real proper sentences written, um, and uh, people, you know, still click on them. It's incredible where I'm like, well, do you really expect that someone would be doing that? Yeah? Syn syntax is uh, the flow of the sentence, making sure that it makes sense. Um, I've, seen, I've seen where um, obviously not a native English speaker was writing a sentence and the words might have been, you know, uh, instead of uh, how do, it would say do how, things like that. Um, and then contextual clues. The thing that tipped off our VP of, uh, of Finance was that it said, please excuse any spelling errors sent from my iPhone. And my CEO does not have an iPhone. And that was the number one clue for him, was, and he was thinking, just did he get a new phone, right? And there were a lot of questions. When there's questions and you think about it, then, then that's the best thing. Um, again, tone and signature, look at those. So what we just talked about, I want to talk a little bit about these emails. So if you look at the, 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 the phishing, and I just got these off the, the internet, so these aren't any of our clients or anything I got, I got from my company. Um, the Netflix one where it says, hey, your account has been suspended. Um, and then, hey, click here, update your account, your friends at Netflix. That looks like a pretty legit email. I was actually pretty impressed when I saw that one. Um, I would probably think twice about that one. I, I would probably look at it a few times. But one of the things that can really help you, if you look over here at the PayPal one, and again, this PayPal one is, is very well done. It's well written. There's no um, typos. Uh, grammatically, it makes sense. Um, really just talking about, here, here's what we need to do. It's, it, it's actually very sensible. It doesn't create that urgency like the Netflix one does, where you get it and you're like, oh, my, my account's suspended. Are you kidding me? And, you're, and you, you get emotional about it and you kind of click on that. The PayPal one seems very, very logical and it seems, it seems legit until that email address up top. And that's something you can do in your email. If you mouse over those links and you mouse over the sender, it will show you, it'll just kind of pop up and show you. And that is not PayPal's email address. It would say paypal.com. And if you moused over the Netflix one on, on your account, you would probably see that it said something like, um, your account.netflix.update.com, right? It would be a strange URL. It wouldn't be to netflix.com. So those are the things that you really need to look at. Again, if you're stopping and you're thinking, is this legit? Then mousing over those links and, and really kind of scrutinizing the sender is the best way for you to kind of look at those. So these are both fish. <laughs> Did you text back, don't click on that link? <laughs> Personally, what I do is I open up my browser and I type in the URL. You know, I've, if I got that email and it said, you know, you need to go update, I open up my browser and I go netflix.com, I log in, I check everything out. I don't click on the links. 
it, it truly is just the easiest way for you to, um, to, to avoid getting caught in something like that. Um, and then here's another example of a, of a potential fish. Again, this was online banking. Um, hey, someone's actually trying to get into your account. There were a number of, uh, of, of invalid attempts to log in. Please click here, right? This creates such urgency. You're like, what? Oh my gosh, I wasn't trying to log in. You call your husband. Were you trying to log into the, the account? You know, uh, was someone else, was someone trying to log into the account? You, you, no, no, no. Then you click because you want to go make sure that everything is okay. And that's exactly how they get you. When they're creating that that panic, when they're when they're when they're eliciting an emotion from you, um, that's really when you're going to fall for it and you're going to click on something. So again, if you get something like that in your inbox, open up your browser, type in the URL, and then you can check it out from that perspective. So again, the malicious links um, they may hide they may hide the true destination, um, even, and then even if you do click on it and then you go to a landing page and it looks like the kind of landing page that you would expect it to be, it could be just completely copied over. I've seen I've seen them like word for word copied over, but then the logins that you're that you're giving, um, they don't go anywhere. They'll just send you through a loop because all they're doing is just collecting that data, and then you think, oh gosh, look, the login is broken. Um, so making sure that you're that you're watching out for the landing pages and then copied domains. Again, shortened links. Have you ever seen shortened links? Um, there's services like called Bitly. Um, they, they'll, they'll shorten the link. Um, they make, they'll take like a big long URL like this and make it about this big. So it's a lot easier for you to manage. Um, marketing people use them a lot. Um, but those are the ones, again, if you, if you hover over them, you'll be able to see what the true destination is. So even if someone does send you a shortened link, it might be legitimate, but you want to check it by hovering over it to make sure. Um, again, always check the, the, the destination, hover over the anchor. Um, mobile hold for a second. Yeah, oh, so on your mobile, yes. I always mess this up on my mobile. Um, so on the mobile, if you just hold it, instead of just clicking on it, just hold it for a couple of seconds, then it'll show you then what the URL is, even on your mobile phone, so you don't have to do that. I feel like this page wants me to do something. Ah, oh, here it is. So here's my cautionary tale, Maria. This is the true story of my friend. Um, so Maria, busy mom, busy working mom, Christmas time, extra stress. Maria worked uh, a marketing person, was very, very well educated uh, on cybersecurity threats, uh, worked uh, as a contractor in a cybersecurity company, and uh, understands phishing and hacking and everything else. You know, she writes about it, she publishes it, right? She, she sees this content all of the time. Christmas time, she got an email like that one from the bank and was just frantic and stressed out and she clicked on it and she logged in and nothing happened and she thought that maybe the site was down and then she got busy and distracted with something else and she went back later and then called me in a panic and said that $800 had been taken out of her savings account. And so, again, it's that, it's that moment where you have to be especially um, ready, right? Especially um, just careful about what you're doing and think about it from online because you can fall for it at any time. Um, I recently fell for a simulation that my company does. We send out emails that mimic uh, phishing email attacks so that you don't actually fall for a real one. And I fell for one um, because it was an emotional trigger. And I don't even know why I fell for it, because I didn't request any time off. But it said, hey, your time off has been denied. And I was like, what? You know, and clicked on it. And then they said, hey, that was actually a phishing simulation. If that was a real fish, you would have been, you would have been caught in it. Um, so it's that emotional trigger that you have to be very careful of. Urgency, uh, again, you're distracted, you get panicked about something, you're worrying about something. Reward is also another big one. Hey, there, we found, uh, this is FedEx. We have a package that we're trying to deliver to you. Please click on this link. Yep. Yeah, so reward, uh, again, urgency. Um, uh, any, again, anything that kind of triggers an emotional response Take a step back, think about it. Are you going to click on it? Uh, you know, call someone to check it out if you need to. 
Um, and then now this password security, I think this is actually a great one for your clients as well. So 20% uh, of uh, cybercrime victims um, use the same online password across all online accounts. And some of you are sitting there thinking, no, I don't. 58% uh, of cybercrime victims shared their device and or their passwords. So I've given a friend uh, my login to, link, um, to Netflix or um, I let someone um, know what my password was for Amazon so they could order something. Um, that is usually when um, you know, you're getting in big trouble. And again, sharing passwords is, is never a good practice. Um, just, I used to share them with my husband to think, oh, and then I won't forget it, right? But it, again, still not a great practice to share them because it, it just makes them that much more easy for people to get to. Um, so never share passwords. Effective passwords are long. They're complex, they're unique, and you change them often. And when you think about how many online accounts you may have, that makes it very challenging. Um, you know, having a password, I would never remember that. I would never remember, I would remember this one because it's easy, but then that's probably the first thing. Actually, the first one that, that a hacker will try is one, two, three, four, five, six. That's the first one they'll try. And then they'll start moving down to these other ones, right? And even though you, you use letters instead of I'm sorry, numbers and, and symbols instead of the letters, they'll, they'll still get to it. Not, it's not a strong, yes, yes, they will get to it. Um, there are a number of free tools that you can use that will save your passwords. Um, there's one of them, the one that I use is called LastPass. And it's, it's a free tool. Um, there's another, uh, there's a number of different ones and I'm blanking on their names, but there's, there's free tools where if you just enable it on your phone or on your computer, every time you create an account or you change your password, it'll pop up and it'll say, hey, do you want me to remember this? And you say, yes, I would like you to remember this. That's one really easy way for you to protect your passwords. Another way is with multi-factor authentication, which I know um, that Apple has recently moved to from, from a consumer perspective. Right, so anytime we try to change something or do something you know, within our Apple account, uh, I always get a, a text message from them. Um, and Google actually, even my Gmail, my, all of my Google accounts, same thing. You get, um, every so often it'll say, it'll say, hey, can you log in again? I'll log in, I'll put in my password, and it'll say, okay, I sent a text to your phone. Now put that, put that password in here now. And I'll have to put in a six number uh, code so that I can actually get through. So that, this is the best way for you to really protect your accounts and to protect your passwords, um, is to just take all of these steps and make sure that you're, you're, you're maintaining that, that level of security. So threat browsing in public. A lot of people like to use public networks. Public networks are not always safe. They really are not. Um, anyone can get on them. Um, they can be uh, this called this man in the middle, um, where someone is actually gaining access to your computer while you think you're just using free Wi-Fi. Um, there's also visual hacking. So if you think about, you open up your laptop and you're sitting in Starbucks, and then you go to log into an account and you type in your. If someone is looking for passwords and they're sitting near you. They can see what, what site did you go to. They can see what your username was. And if they're you know, very good, then they're also figuring out what you just typed to get your password in there as well. Um, and then, again, stolen devices um, left in a public place, 44% of them. I have done that. I lost my phone. It was stolen. Immediately picked up and turned off. But luckily, I had a passcode and also remote wiping which is very important. Um, if, if you're able to, um, you know, whether it's Google or Android or Apple, I believe they all have um, some kind of a, a utility that will allow you to remotely wipe your phone. So if it is stolen, people can't get into all that information that you have there. So for your phone, so it, again, it depends. Yes, uh, so the question was how do you access that? So all of the major uh, manufacturers 
should have, um, and more for smartphones, um, they should have some kind of a, an app store, um, whether it's, um, you know, that's actually what Apple calls theirs is the app store. Um, I don't know, does anyone have an Android or a Google phone? Android. You've got Google Play, okay, Google Play has, has the apps. They should have a utility where you can go in and look for um, either remote wipe, um, the app that Apple has is, uh, it, the remote wipe is in their Find iPhone. So you can actually track your phone and, and see where it is. Um, but if you just search within those, um, those app stores, there should be something either that they have created, that they have a utility, or there should be um, another, a utility created by one of their partners that would be in there. Find my device on Google, thank you. So again, avoid public wireless um, networks if possible. Um, I know sometimes you want to, and I've done it, and, but when I do it, I make sure that I'm not doing anything important. I would never log onto a public network and pay my bills um, or log into my banking account. Um, I avoid using some of my work accounts um, and if I do, I make sure that um, I'm, I'm using our secure methods to do that. However, that's been prescribed by your IT teams. Um, you know, if you can find a reputable uh, network, um, typically, typically some of the um, carrier networks are, are not bad. A lot more, a lot better. But I've seen. Uh, so I go to I go to trade shows and events where um, a lot of the cybersecurity technical people gather. And they like to set up fake networks to try to catch you um, and then just let you know that, that they caught you. Um, and some people will sit and, uh, in the Starbucks and set up a, a fake network that says Starbucks 2, right? And where, where you'll be like, oh, they have another one. I'll just you know, get on that second one. So always look for something that is as reputable as possible. Um, be mindful of your surroundings. And again, find, oh, there you go. Find my iPhone, remote wipe, and then password protect. Your, your phone should always be password protected. And I heard, I heard you earlier and, and the earlier speaker say, see something, say something. And that also applies to cybersecurity. If you see something that looks suspicious, if you get an email from your bank and it looks like a fish, you should report that to your bank. You should let them know that that's happened. If you uh, get something at work and it you know, looks suspicious, you should forward that to your IT team or report it in whatever method that they've, they've told you to do that. Um, you, by doing that, you're basically going to help stop attacks. When you see something and say something um, and it gets reported, we can, uh, companies like mine, we can help shut down the full attack across your entire company. We can help uh, work with other partners to shut down the website that's doing it. Um, take down those fake pages, things like that. Um, and you protect your coworkers and of course your client data, which is extremely important. So some free resources we do have on our, our website, and these are applicable both to individuals and companies. Um, we have, um, these are, uh, they're called, called just you know, computer-based training, right? And you can download these for free. Um, we have, this is just some of them that we have around um, ransomware, passwords, malicious links, um, spear phishing. We have games up there that you can also download. And again, they're all free. Um, you can just reference them, watch a video if you want to get some additional information or share it with your clients um, to help educate them. It's not cooperating. We have like posters and infographics. So if you wanted to, um, again, hand out something or uh, use it at an event if you were trying to educate some of your clients around cybersecurity, we have assets up here that you can also use. There's infographics, posters, presentations if you wanted to even do a presentation like this to some of your clients to help educate them. They're all up there. Download them for free. Um, and then with your organizations, um, I mentioned uh, we do phishing simulations and I fell for one. 
right? So it's a safe you know, email that you get and then it immediately tells you, you know, why it was a phishing attack or what went wrong. We have a free version of that solution that anyone can download and use within their organization to help educate everyone across the company. Um, again, helps and, and I always say, um, you know, it, it you know, can look like a duck and, and quack like a duck, but you don't really know it's a duck until you've really actually seen a duck before. Right? If a duck was walking by, you'd never seen one before, you'd be like, what's that bird? Like, what's that strange bird? This is what, this is what a simulated phishing exercise does, is it shows you what a phishing email is and what it, how it acts and what it looks like, but it's completely safe, right? And it, and it creates that, that muscle memory where next time you see one, you're going to say, oh, wait, that kind of looks like something I should be checking out. That was it. Any questions? Mm -hmm. On your computer? Yeah, and, and that can work for you. But like I said, there are, there are also some other um, applications out there that you can just download onto your phone. Um, again, I use LastPass. And so I have a special password for LastPass to activate that, to get into all of those. Um, and that's the only way that it will, it will work. So I would have to log in first. And then you have to, it almost turns into you only have to remember, you know, one, one password at, at that point. Like the last password you have, maybe that is, that's clever. It just dawned on me there, thank you. Um, yeah, so you know, something like that can definitely be helpful. Um, I often say do not remember, uh, especially uh, you know, when I'm shopping online and it says, oh, do you want me to remember this credit card? I'm like, no, I will type it in again, I'm, that's okay, I'm not, you, know, you don't need to remember it. Um, but you know, look at a couple different solutions and you know, see what you might be comfortable with. Um, you know, your book, if you lost your book, what would happen? Um, you have to think about it that way, too. Depending on that password, you can know that your laptop was stolen, or would you recommend plugging it or whatever? So you can go to LastPass and just say, hey, just let me tell you to go into my LastPass. So you can have it on your computer, your tablet, and whatever, and it'll remember all the passwords. If you know that you've lost them, you can go into, like, hey, put it down until I figure out what's going to happen. And then it'll just log into LastPass on my computer uh, or just Remember that that nothing is a hundred percent fail safe, right? I mean, um, there there have been um, you know passwords hacked into, um, but you know finding one that you're comfortable with, that you feel has a good track record, that's easy for you to use and access, like like LastPass, like across all of your different devices. Um, so it's a good way for you to to manage your passwords. With, again, with so many online accounts these days, it's it's a little dizzying. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. And I can echo about password managers. I think that's a really good solution. I, I use password safe myself because I trust Bruce Schneier quite a bit. He's a, what's that? One password? That's good, too. So there's a lot of options to go from. Yeah. Um, so th this, what we were just talking about, what Susan had brought to us, is this kind of seems like this is something that fits into a lot of our annual awareness training. This is something we have to learn about once a year and hear about once a year and everything else. It's really easy to just kind of put it in one year and out the other because it's something that we sometimes hear quite a bit. But um, we're actually seeing this happen. As we get contacts from individuals impacted by domestic violence or the shelters or the safe houses or other things like that, is that as it gets easier and easier to use these kinds of attacks, I mean, there's, there's platforms that you can just pay a small amount of money and it'll do it for you. So it's not hard to leverage this type of attack. And we talked about already how the abusive partners are already very, very motivated and already dedicated 
and persistent in what they're trying to do. So they're going to use the resources they have available anyways. If they believe that your agency is somehow an enemy of theirs because you're helping their victim escape, or if they believe that you are somehow a part of that, or that you yourself or your organization or whatever else the case may be, how difficult is it to believe that they would send an email and try to get information out of you? And the fact is there's commercial tools that can put that, they can take care of everything except for sending the email, or including sending the email. So you go to the link and you're infected, you're compromised. So this is something that it's not just hypothetical, it's not just theoretical. These are things that we are actually literally seeing occur, particularly for audiences such as yourself, particularly for social workers, therapists, law enforcement, of course, certainly and all sorts of agencies like that. So this is something that is happening. If it hasn't happened, if you have not yet gotten a phishing message, you probably don't have an email account. But if you do have an email account, you've probably received something that is more and more convincing. So it's definitely something to pay attention to. I do encourage you to avail yourself of some of the tools that uh, CoFence offers. Like I said, great company. I've uh, known and used them for quite some time myself. And uh, I'm not affiliated with them, so I don't make any money off of saying that. So just <laughs> mention that right there.